What's up? What's up, family? This is Nati. I'm just Nati Maruleg. I'm super excited. Like I say always, I'm really excited about what I'm about to share with you. Uh, it's going to be a great session, so I'm excited about that. And welcome. If you're joining us for the first time, this is the Prayer Factory. This is 100 Days of Devotion and Discipleship. If you're around the corner, we are just here by Midrand. Eh? We're just around the corner, so so make sure that you follow us and you know what's happening. John chapter 4, verse 1. Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, he was not, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. I think that's a sermon right there. He had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of the ground where Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. Jacob's well. That's a sermon right there. And Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. In other words, he was alone. The, this, the Samaritan woman said, You are a Jew. I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. That's the explanation that the writer gives, right? So that part that says, For Jews do not associate with Samaritans should be in brackets. And this, the, the same uh, uh, kind of brackets are there in the words that says, His disciples had gone down, gone into the town to buy food. So the writer wants you to understand why the the Jesus Christ would ask someone else to give him water. It's because his disciples were not there. And why this person being asked to give Jesus Christ water would have objection to that request. It's because Jews and Samaritans did not have any relation. So this goes back um, some centuries before Jesus Christ speaks to this woman. There's always been a difficult contention between the Samaritans and the Jews in Jerusalem because the Jews in Jerusalem claimed superiority and then said that the Samaritans, which who are also in, in a sense descendants of Abraham and, and, and Jews by their own right, uh, they are not as Jewish as we are. Uh, because the temple is not with them firstly, so God can only be worshipped here. And they were not given access to the temple. So they then decided that they would worship God where, wherever they want, particularly in mountains. So Jesus Christ is speaking to this woman. And she says, we don't have relation. You can't ask me for water. But Jesus answers her in this way. He says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. If you underline that word living water, it will do you good. Jesus Christ is not speaking here about water that is physical. He's speaking here about him being the gift that satisfies eternally. So he says, if you knew the gift of God, if you were aware of the person you were speaking to in the sense of what I've come to do, what I establish and what I give, you would have been the one to ask me. I would give you that which I have, which is waters that are living, waters that are eternal in nature. So then we continue. And this woman at verse 11 is astonished at what Christ is saying. So he says, Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with, and the well is too deep. So she is still understanding what Jesus Christ just said from a physical perspective that, Look, I get you. You, you can give me cool water. You can give me sweet water. You can give me, like you say, for a lack of a better word, living water. Uh, but the problem is you have no, no, no container to draw with. And in reality, the well is quite deep. So you would need something to get to the water. 
But Jesus Christ then explains because there is a, a sense that the woman is not grasping what he says. Then she continues to say, are you greater than Jacob? Because it was Jacob who gave us this world and drank from it himself as did also his sons and living stock. What she's challenging is the mentality of Jesus Christ to think of himself as one who gives water that is more satisfying than water that is coming from this world. Imagine this world that was dug some hundred years ago, uh, to some extent probably a thousand years before this incident. It's the world that Jesus Christ supposedly or apparently, at least according to the understanding of the woman, is claiming he has better water than this. And, and I think, I, I assume that this is the, the, the kind of an understanding the Jews of Jerusalem would have heard of Christ. This, this claims by this man that are not substantiated, that are are uh, in a sense ridiculously ridiculing the establishment. The sense that he had something better to offer was mind-boggling to some of these hearers. So this woman also is, is certainly not necessarily appreciative of what Jesus Christ is saying. And she says, are you greater than Jacob, our forefather? Now Jesus Christ answers in verse 13 and he says, Everyone who drinks from this water will actually be thirsty again. And, and, and is, is that not the reality of our religion? That all of our pursuits of God outside of Christ will leave us dehydrated, will leave us emptier than we were. All our pursuits to pursue God look after... Oh, my friends... It had cut, you know, space issues, but let's try. Verse 13, it says, Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. So the Lord is truly here speaking to this woman and he says, woman, lest you drink from the water that I offer, this water is not satisfying her to eternity. So he continues, but whosoever drinks the water that I give them will never thirst again. Will never thirst again. And Indeed, the water that I give will become in them a spring of living water welling up into eternal life. And I, I love this part because the, whole, the Lord is not talking about this only here. Remember where he says, those who believe in me will have out of their belly flowing rivers of living water. And, and of course, if you, if you know contemporary music, you will be immediately reminded of, out of my belly shall flow rivers of living water. That man is quoting scripture. Because the Lord Jesus Christ is having this concept so 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 attached to his ministry that those who come to him will be satisfied eternally but also they shall become conduits they themselves shall become conduits by which the flow of this water shall reach the entire world talk about eden talk about eden now the Lord Jesus Christ says, out of himself, this well shall swell up unto eternal life. Then the woman said to him, sir, please give me this water so I won't get thirsty again and keep coming back here to draw water. I love this. There's suddenly an awakening, a realization that perhaps I do need this water because then I would not have to come back here. Whatever water this man is offering, if he gives it to me, I would not need to keep coming back again because he is saying the man who drinks this water, the woman who drinks this water will not thirst again. But certainly the Lord Jesus Christ then answers her and says, the, the, the best to do it is for you to go and call your husband. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ is inviting this woman, but he then brings a spanner into the mix and says, but before I can give you the water, help me reach out to your husband. Then she says to him, I have no husband. She says to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is that you have had five husbands up to this point, and the man that you are with currently is not your husband. Look at that. What you have said is, just, is, is quite true. The Lord says, 
I find it interesting that the Lord offers salvation to this woman. The Lord offers eternal life to this woman. And he says, recognize that the gift of God has come. And the gift of God comes carrying with him eternal life. And he will give it to whomsoever he will. So this woman is, is finding herself in a place where she's, she's happy to, to take this, this life from this man. And he says, no, rather bring with you your husband. But he then immediately gets very deep and shows her that what she's saying of having no husband is related to the fact that she had been married five times. She has, she has had five husbands and she's currently staying with someone who is actually not even her husband. And when the word of God, when the power of the Holy Spirit that reveals these things, that convicts our heart, is communicated at this level, what we often do is what this woman does next. When the word of the Lord challenges a current circumstance, hey, 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 let me say it for, for what it is, hey, hey, her life in the world, when the word of God challenges her status quo and her living outside of Christ, what she does is she falls back to religion. Look at this. It's, it's after this challenge, she says to him, I can see that you are a prophet. I, I see that you, you perceive these things by prophetic unction. And, and it's okay, it's good, and it's all wonderful. But what you must know, O oh man of God, is that our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews worship in Israel and say we must all worship there, but you are wrong. Don't we all do this? That when the word of the Lord comes, Instead of the word of the Lord dealing with us from our sins so that we are convicted and we repent, what we usually do is to turn around and say, but, but who gives you this right to question me? Who, who gives you the right to, to judge me? Don't judge me. Because the Bible says, do not judge. Who gives you the right to point fingers at me? Who gives you the right to have authority over me? Is that, is that not the natural response of the millennials? And I mean, let me not say millennials, of everyone when the word of God confronts them, that instead of looking unto ourselves and being repentant and having a sorrowfulness that leads to true repentance, what we usually do to protect ourselves is that we raise the wall of religion, point back at the one who is preaching and say, how dare you challenge my religion? My fathers worshipped in this mountain. I know my religion. I know what is right. You have no right to tell me. Now Jesus Christ being so kind and loving and then responds to her and says, he says to her, he says to her, woman, believe me, the time is coming when you will worship the Father neither in this mountain nor even in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. But we worship what you know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and now has come where true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. So the truth element we can't get rid of. Most of us love the idea of worshipping God in spirit. Oh, we are so spiritful. Oh, we are so spiritful. But the truth we shun away from. We shun away from. We are happy to lay prostrate before God, lift up our hands, sing songs and hymns, dance till dawn. But we are not willing to have truth be part of the vehicle that we use to worship God. So Christ here speaks that Christian worship, the doxology of our worship is not spirit. It's not truth only, but it's spirit and truth. Is spirit and truth. I'm not saying that lay upon yourself the burden of legalism. What I'm saying is that don't also be a balloon filled with helium that keeps on climbing and climbing without any weight that carries and anchors it down. And that's what he's speaking about. He says, you must worship in spirit and in truth. In truth. In truth. He says, 
for the Father is looking for such worshippers. In other words, true worship unto the Father is by the Father's prescription. True worship unto the Father is not by our own prescription. We may have preferred to worship God in Jerusalem in the temple. You may have preferred to worship God in these mountains. But a time has come where it is not the building that matters, where it is not the shrine or the altar that matters, but it is the heart, the heart, the heart of worship that matters. And he says, the Father seeks after worshippers who will worship not simply in spirit, not simply in truth, but in spirit and truth. The woman said, I know when Messiah comes. Oh, he will explain everything to us. Now the Lord Jesus Christ looks at this woman lovingly and says to her, I am. The one speaking to you, I am he, the Messiah. In other words, I will reveal this truth that as you worship, if you are to worship, your act of worship must be both a spiritual exercise, but also a truthful exercise. It means worship is both is both expressive, but also both reflective. I can't daily so. Worship is expressive, but worship is inspective. I, I, I express to God, but I inspect into my heart in worship. True devotion is not a lifting only of hands, but it's a setting of hands on hearts. Kai, Kai. Hallelujah. So we, we are called, this is a beautiful passage, we can talk about it the whole day. We can talk about it the whole day. But you are being invited today. Worship the Lord. Worship Him in spirit and in truth. That is the way the, the Savior reveals. That's the way the Christ reveals. Amen. <laughs>